Hi, everybody. I know it's a weird time in China, but I hope you're doing well wherever in the world you happen to be. Um, for the time being, what we're going to do is I'll videotape my lectures like I, like I was, like you were here, um, and I'll have you do the homework questions and submit those as photos to a Dropbox um, after each unit. Um, Tess, we'll work on that in a moment. Uh, my guess is we'll probably go ahead and uh, just have you do those online with a lockdown browser. Um, we'll figure that out in a little bit. Anyway, today I want to do chapter four. Uh, chapter four, pretty much review, which is nice. Um, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time uh, going over the new things in it, although most of it you've seen already anyway. Um, the first section of the chapter deals with projectile motion, uh, derivatives of unit vectors, which we've talked about already, so I'm not too worried about. Um, but this last section deals with drag forces, centripetal acceleration, which we'll look at a different way, and frames of reference, um, which are kind of fun. Uh, but anyway, drag force is just a frictional force that acts against the motion of an object. It's like friction, except a little bit more interesting, through a medium such as air and water. Uh, drag forces must be taken into account when you're designing cars, planes, automobiles, you name it. Um, and prevent velocity from increasing without limit in nature. Just real quick, we'll, de we'll define this as um, drag force D is equal to some constant B, which depends on the, the configuration of the object, uh, times the velocity. Now, in reality, I think I've mentioned this before, real drag forces typically are more of a polynomial, um, like C, some constant C times V squared plus B times V, et cetera. You can even have a third order term and et cetera. Automobile manufacturers are usually worried about this, but usually the largest term for most objects are usually B, Sometimes there's a C term, depending on how non-aerodynamic it is. Uh, for now, we're going to do it very simply and just look at the BV term. Um, yes, I know this is an oversimplification, but if we include this part here, we either end up with infinite series, Taylor expansions, or we have to do differential equations, which is slightly outside of our ballpark. So how do we solve it real quick? For a falling object, um, we've got gravity acting downward on it. Mg, and we've got the drag force acting against that motion, and I'll make it a little bit smaller so it's not quite at terminal velocity yet, uh, of Bv acting this way. So this is a falling object. It's still accelerating this way. Um, it hasn't reached terminal velocity yet, uh, but this drag force is slowing it down a little bit. So what do we have here? We've got the net force in the y direction is Mg minus Bv. And just rearranging that a little bit, replacing with the net force with MA, we end up with MG minus BV is equal to MA, the net force. Solving for the acceleration, we get this. Um, uh, we know acceleration is equal to that. Um, in this case, if you divide all the terms by M, you'll end up with G minus BV over M times that. And that's equal to the acceleration. Now it gets a little bit more fun, uh, just rearranging it a little bit. Um, we would like to find um, the velocity. So um, remember that acceleration can be written as dv over dt. So here's my dv and dt, but I've already rearranged it a little bit. I've rearranged the equation so that this term is equal dv over dt, but I've moved it around. So I've got dv here with the v and I've got dt by itself over here. Uh, what happens when we integrate this, and I know we'll spend more time with it later, you can stick it into your Inspire if you want, but you'll discover that this side is equal to ln of this term equals negative b over m times t, and that's after some rearranging. Um, or simplifying a little bit, we end up with this equation. And you might say, whoa, wait a second, isn't this the same as what we've seen before? Um, remember, for example, the current um, uh, in a, uh, let's see, oh, maybe I should have done current. Uh, the voltage in an RC circuit is equal to the final voltage minus one minus E to the negative T over RC. Whoops, I'm running out of space. Yeah, it looks the same way. Um, so in this case, 
this is the final velocity. And you might say, wait a second, why is this the final velocity? Um, just like this was V final, this is, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> that's voltage final. This is velocity final, small v. Um, how do we solve this? Well, think about it real quick. What happens when a falling object reaches its terminal velocity? Well, an object reaches terminal velocity when the force of gravity is equal to the drag force. At that point, there's no net force on it. What's that velocity? Well, it's when these two terms are equal to each other, when mg is equal to dv. Rearranging that real quick, we get v is equal to mg over v. And oftentimes we call this v sub t because it's the terminal velocity of a falling object. Notice this term right here, sure enough, is the terminal velocity of the falling object. What does the graph look like? For a falling object, if you graphed its velocity versus time, you would end up with a graph that, yes, looks, well, actually, I should put this line in first, that approaches this line asymptotically. Whoosh. What's this final velocity? Well, it's m, it's this term right here. It's just mg over v. The initial slope of this line, if you could somehow figure it, the initial slope is about 9.8 meters per second squared. Why? When it first starts falling, since air drag is proportional to velocity, when it first starts falling, there's actually no air drag on it at all. It's just mg because it has no velocity yet. And so initially the acceleration is 9.8, but it very quickly starts becoming smaller as this drag force starts getting larger and larger as the velocity increases. Um, how do you find the B part? Usually experimentally. Um, you simply find uh, the drag force on an object using a wind tunnel or experimentally just by measuring the, the resultant acceleration of the object or finding the terminal velocity. Um, if you had been here, we would have found the terminal velocity of some falling coffee filters. And based on that, we would have calculated what that constant B is. Hopefully that makes some sense. Do you need to memorize this equation? The answer is no, but you're going to see it reappear over and over again. I've, you've seen it before in, in E and M. It's going to appear every time we look at drag forces. It's going to take a form like that. Oh, I'm sorry. For large, yeah. If you let t approach uh, infinity, this term approaches zero, and sure enough, the final velocity approaches that. Um, for small time, when time is about zero, um, you end up with this, which is approximately gt. Um, so yeah, at the beginning of the motion, it's nearly free falling, but as time goes on, not so much. Um, how does the uh, how does the drag force change with time? Like I told you before, initially um, there is no drag force when the velocity is zero, um, but as the velocity starts getting bigger the drag force starts getting larger, and as the velocity gets even larger, the drag force increases as well. Um, one quick story about this. Um, cats have an interest, not that you should not, this was not discovered by experiment, but by looking at the data. Um, if cats are sleeping on the edge of a balcony of a tall building, and I may have told you this before, so my apologies, um, there is, if the cat falls below three floors, no problem. Um, why? Um, cats are fairly resilient. Usually they're fine. So between zero and three floor is no problem. But there's a kill zone, and this is going to sound really strange, between the third floor to the tenth floor. And then oddly enough, above the tenth floor and up, it's fine again. And you're like, what? What's going on? What's going on with cats falling here? Um, the answer is, is the cats are high enough now that they, they can hurt themselves and they don't have enough time to spin their tails around so that they land on their feet if they are falling from this height. Here it doesn't matter if they land on their feet. Here they don't have enough time to do it. Up here you might say, well, wait a second, aren't they falling faster? The answer is no, because they reach terminal velocity and they have enough time to land on their feet. So if they fall from up here, 
ironically, they're more likely to survive than if they're in this range here, um, which sounds very strange, but it has to do with terminal velocity and giving the cat enough time to rotate themselves down and around to their legs. All right. Um, so, um, with drag force, just real quick with projectile motion. Um, with drag force, we end up with the angle here, or sorry, without drag force is equal to the angle it lands at. With drag force, you end up with a much steeper curve over here, where this angle here is much larger than what it started with. Um, of course, the maximum height and range are both reduced. Uh, trajectory is not only or not symmetric either. Um, spherical cows. I've got to mention this one real quick. <laughs> when modeling drag forces on really complex objects, uh, it turns out it's it's not as easy as you would think. I, I mentioned before you can find it experimentally with a with a wind tunnel, uh, but. Physicists oftentimes are asked to model air drag on complex objects like a falling cow. They oftentimes assume the cow is simply spherical, a very non-realistic approximation. Uh, in physics in general, if you hear a physicist say, oh, that's a spherical cow if I've ever heard it, it means that you've oversimplified the calculation to the point of absurdity. Um, I just want to quick show you this, if I, if I can get it to play. Um, a quick episode from... Let's see if I can get it work uh, from um, uh, Big Bang Theory. Oh shoot! I gotta get out of the pen mode. Well, let me see if I can do that. Uh, undo pen, turn on, play. I just checked the house. There's probably 20, 25 people in there. You're kidding? Is that all? All? In particle physics, 25 is Woodstock. <laughs> expecting such a crowd. I'm a little nervous. It's okay. Just open with a joke. You'll be fine. Okay. Uh, joke. Okay. How about this? Um, okay. Uh, there's this farmer, and he has these chickens, but they won't lay any eggs. So, he uh, calls a physicist to help. The physicist then does some calculations, and he says, oh, I have a solution, but... Uh, it, it only works for spherical chickens in a vacuum. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, sorry, I just had heard it before. So why did you come? Because I knew you'd screw this up. Well, I didn't screw it up. Oh, please, I admit that spherical chicken joke, that was hilarious. <laughs> but it was straight downhill from there. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little quick clip. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, spherical cows, or in this case, spherical chickens, an absurd approximation. Um, at Air Jag Mini Lab, what we would have discovered is that if we were going to drop coffee filters down the stairwell, we discovered the terminal velocity. Based on that, we could, for example, figure out that if it reached terminal velocity at two, let me put my pen back on again, um, at two meters per second, we could figure out at that point that b times 2 would have to equal mg for this object, and we could calculate what the drag force was. Uh, circular motion, you already know this really well already. Um, even traveling at uniform velocity in a circular path, you have acceleration, not from the change in the magnitude of the velocity vector, but because of the change in the direction, which is by definition an acceleration. Acceleration is any change in the velocity vector. In this case, the change in the direction. A um, couple of quick definitions. Capital T is the period. Average velocity, the circumference of that circle. There is my pen. Circumference of the circle divided by the period gives us our average velocity, distance over time. Uh, frequency, again, if you remember from chemistry, is defined as one over the period. So you can do some really quick, fun things here. Um, oh, again, remember for these kind of problems, um, the direct conversions, uh, or I guess we could calculate it, um, using 2 pi r over t. Um, we could solve this fairly quickly. Um, we have this many revolutions per minute. Uh, we could calculate what the period would be. Uh, the period in this case, the time required for one revolution would be uh, 60 seconds. That's in one minute. And during that time, it does 830 revolutions. 
So 60 divided by that would give us our period for just one revolution and our radius then uh, 2 pi times the radius 0 0.29 over the period, <laughs> I'll just write it as that, exp that horrible fraction, sorry. And if you solve that, you would calculate the velocity. Some of you are saying, wait, Ms. Comer, couldn't we also have done it this way, calculated using omega? The answer is, yeah, you could also do it that way. Uh, where omega is the angular frequency, you could convert revolutions, take this times 2 pi divided by 60, would give us how many radians per second, which you could then plug in for omega. That would also work. Um, just want to take a quick look at this. You already know this formula for centripetal acceleration, or one of them. Uh, just a quick reminder, I'm not going to mention it again. You can also write this as 2 pi v over the period or as 4 pi squared r over t squared or as omega squared r. Which is the best one of these? The answer is whichever one is most convenient. Um, all these give you the centripetal acceleration. Uh, but I do want to mention just real quick where this one comes from. Uh, last year, I think I derived it we're using geometry um, really, really quickly. Um, I just want to show you another way of doing it now that you know how to take derivatives of vectors. Um, take a look at it. As the object goes around, you know that the velocity vector is perpendicular or is tangent to the circle at each point. Here's the radius vector. And the centripetal acceleration is pointing inward towards the center of the circle. So take a look at this situation real quick. Here's an object moving around a circle in a clockwise direction. At some instant here, it's at point P1 at some radius r. O is the center of the circle, moving with some velocity v. And at some instant later, it's over here at another point called P2. And now the velocity is tangent to the circle here. My question is, what's the acceleration? Well, let's put a line that bisects the angle between those two and call both these angles theta. So this is the theta before this midpoint, and let's put it right on the y-axis so it's an equal theta before and after y. Um, and there's the x-axis. We can break this velocity over here into its vertical component and horizontal component. So I'll call this one V1y where this is V1. I can draw it out here, whoops. I can't, sorry. And over here, we'll break this into its two components. Um, I'll call this V2. Let me try drawing one more time here. I'm just having a little issues with my pen. There we go. And where this is the horizontal component of that velocity and this is the vertical component. Um, how do we find those? Well, it's just good old fashioned trig uh, with a slight little note here, this one's negative because this y component is facing downward. Um, how far did it move during this time? Well, if you remember, arc length is equal to theta times r. So how far, what's this distance right here between these two points? The answer is it's going to be r times 2 theta. So how much time did it take? Well, if you remember, um, Velocity times time is equal to distance. Rearranging it just slightly to solve for the, for the time. Uh, time is going to be uh, displacement over velocity. So displacement over velocity gives us delta t. Um, what's the acceleration? Well, by definition, it's the change in the velocity over time. Um, and if you notice this case, the acceleration in the x direction is zero. Why? Because both of these two terms are identical. But in the y direction, we have a slightly more interesting term. Um, it's the final velocity, which is this negative term. Remember this negative part right here, minus the original positive right here over the time, which we calculated over here. And we get this expression. Now that expression itself is pretty interesting. But what's the instant, uh, sorry, I'll go backwards. This is the average velocity, or sorry, average acceleration between those two points. But what's the instantaneous? Well, to find the instantaneous, I need to let theta approach zero. And if you do this real quick, either on your calculator or if you remember this from algebra, sign the theta over theta as theta approaches zero, approaches one. And so this limit simply becomes this. 
So what's the acceleration in the y direction? It's negative v squared over r. So that negative sign, if you remember, this was only in the y direction. So the instantaneous velocity between those two points as you let theta approach zero would put the object right on the y-axis. Remember, theta was measured this way and this way. So as theta approaches zero, what's the acceleration in the y direction? It's negative v squared over r, which means the acceleration vector is pointing straight down this way. And again, we put a sub c on here to indicate this is due to the change in the direction of the velocity, not its magnitude. Um, cars moving counterclockwise, or sorry, clockwise around a circular track at a constant speed. Um, what are the directions of its velocity and acceleration in the given points? Well, at point one, its velocity would be moving this way. What direction is the centripetal acceleration? This way. It's moving at constant speed, so there's no other type of acceleration. So at point one, uh, the velocity is south, and the acceleration is west. At position two, the velocity would be this way, which is west, and the centripetal acceleration would be north. Sorry for my really rotten driving. Um, this one, you could actually very quickly solve. Um, if you got part of a curve, you can figure out the radius of curvature. Um, and you could very quickly solve this one just by doing, um, in this case, probably v squared over r is the easiest one. You've got their velocity, you've got their radius of curvature. And you would, if you solve this one real quick, you'll discover that the accelerations are quite large for the bobsled riders. Um, and if you calculated by, to calculated g's, sorry, I should write g's. Uh, where 1g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared, you could discover that the bobsled riders feel accelerations that are similar to what a jet fighter pilot would experience. Uh, frames of reference, real quick video. This is fun. It's ancient, I realize, but it's actually probably the best one it's ever done. Um, I hope this actually has audio. We'll find out in a moment. Um, <laughs> I think it has audio. Um, ancient one, uh, copyright 1960, yes, I know it's a classic, uh, but it's actually pretty fun. I hope the audio comes in. I would rather add the whole thing here. Give it just a moment. Trust me, it's worth it. You're used to seeing things from a particular point of view. That is, from a particular frame of reference. And things look different to us under different circumstances. At the moment, things look... You look peculiar. You're upside down. No, you're the one that's upside down. No, you're upside down. Well, I'm not. He's the one that's upside down, isn't he? Well, let's start for it. All right.
is relative, but we tend to think of one thing as being fixed and the other thing as being moving. We usually think of the Earth as fixed, and walls are usually fixed to the Earth. So perhaps you were surprised the first time when it was the wall that was moving and not Dr. Hume. A frame of reference fixed to the Earth is the most common frame of reference in which to observe the motion of other things. So, frames of reference, hope you enjoyed the little part right there. Uh, any frame of reference is fine. Usually we use the Earth as a reference. A frame of reference is valid as long as it's not accelerating. Now, a few of you are like, wait a second, isn't the Earth accelerating because we're rotating? Yes, uh, but the centripetal acceleration due to that is actually so small that we usually don't worry about it. Um, another quick example here. to do another experiment on relative motion to show how to compare the velocity of an object in one frame of reference to its velocity in another frame of reference. If I give this dry ice puck a certain start, it moves it straight across the table with a speed which is essentially constant because the forces of friction have been made very small. This is just the law of inertia. An object moves with a constant velocity unless an unbalanced force acts on it. Now, will you give it the same start backwards? Dr. Hume gives it the same start. It moves back in this direction with the same velocity. Now, we are on a car here, a car which can move and which really is going to move in this direction. And we're going to repeat the experiment. All right, let's go. If we were making measurements here, then we would observe the same velocity, that is the same experimental results that we did before. And so would you, because you are observing this experiment through a camera which is fastened to this car. That is, you are in the moving frame of reference with us. But now we're going to do the experiment again, and this time you watch through a camera which is fixed in the Earth frame of reference. So concentrate on watching the pump. Don't let your eye follow us. I think you'll see that it'll move faster that way and not so fast this way, relative to you and relative. So relative velocity, just real quick. Um, most of you know the calculation. Um, if you're trying to find the velocity of object B relative to A, you take the velocity of object B relative to some fixed reference frame minus the velocity of A relative to that same fixed reference frame. Um, there's a simple formula for it. Sorry, that's the bell going off. You can tell where I'm working. Um, and just that difference in velocity will allow you to solve it. Uh, with that, uh, take a look at the chapter. I'll have it linked to the PowerPoint. Um, and when you're ready, uh, I'd like you to take the online quiz for chapter four. It's sometime on your own. Um, next time I talk to you, we'll start working through chapters five and six. Um, that'll be a little bit of a longer section because we'll move into some new material. Have a wonderful time. Send me questions in the WeChat group or just say hi. I'll send you a survey as well um, by WeChat just to sort of see where everybody is and uh, what kind of status you're at. Have a great time. God's blessings wherever you are. And I will see you next time. Bye.